Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Do you ever find yourself having something happen to you that's bad? Maybe not terrible, but it's bad. And then a few days later, something else bad happens. And a few days later, something else bad happens. And you just keep thinking, like, is it seriously? Is this seriously still going? Things keep getting worse and worse and worse. Come on! It's kind of how I felt the last week and a half. Um, last Saturday at the river with a couple of my friends. I jumped into the raft, hit my tooth on a paddle, and chipped my tooth like Jim Carrey from Dumb and Dumber, only it's just not as comedic for me because I'm not getting paid. Um, so then a few days later, me and some of the guys go and work out at the Gospel Rescue Mission every other Monday morning. It's like 6 a.m. That's bad enough. I don't like to work out at 6 a.m. But so we get there, we do lunges and squats, and I'm not in shape. So the rest of that day, my legs are jello. The next day, my legs hurt so bad. And then we have two softball games that night, so I'm excited. Here we go. I get on base. My buddy hits it out there, and I'm thinking, I'm so fast, I'm going to make it home. I literally thought in my head that exact thing. <laughs> As I round second, it feels like an explosion in the back of my leg. I, you know, strain my hamstring. I've never done that before. It stinks really badly. So I'm like, I'm out there, chipped tooth, <laughs> hamstrings all ripped up, now I can't play. And so it's just kind of a bummer. It just keeps going. It's like, not only did my chip my tooth, I had to work out, my legs hurt, and then I was like, I'm so fast, and tear my hamstring or whatever happens, I don't know. Then I have to go to, to James, Pastor James, in Eufaula, and he's a chiropractor, yeah. and he's been trying for months and months to do this thing called it's like acupuncture, but it's with dry needles. I hate needles. Hate them. But I lay down, and hey, I'm just like, I'm hurting so bad, James. Do whatever you need to do to make me feel better. So he's like, okay, I'm going to dry needle you. It's like, oh. So he's like, Bleh! sticks it in there and sticks a needle. Feels like he's digging in your nerves. It's terrible. So it just, it just kind of kept getting like that. And these are s simple, silly things, really, in the grand scheme of things. But I, this last week, I just felt like, what's next? And if you've ever felt like that, which I think all of us have in some sense, you can really relate to the Apostle Paul in Acts 23. So what we see is he's in prison, the passage that was just read to you. He's not only in prison, but then he figures out that 40 plus Jewish men in Israel, which is a largely Jewish city, or in Jerusalem rather, largely Jewish city, these 40 plus guys come under an oath to not eat or drink until they kill him. If you remember what had just happened, Paul has been, everywhere Paul goes, something crazy happens, pretty much. He gets beaten up, he gets thrown in prison, he gets tortured. He finally gets to Jerusalem, which is like this hub of where the people of God live, and they beat him up. He has to be rescued like three times by the Roman government because the Jews are wanting to kill him for preaching the gospel. So he finally gets rescued, I'm safe in prison, and then 40 plus guys, like, alright, we're not going to eat or drink till we kill him. That's where we're at. Can we sympathize with Paul just a little bit here? And so sometimes we see these passages, what, why is this there? Why did God direct Luke to include this part of the, of the story of Paul? We don't have every single thing Paul ever did and said, but we have a selective, the big key things that he said and did in his life. And as we look through this, I think we see three huge things I think we see the certainty of persecution, the secrecy of providence, and lastly, the only way you're going to survive. The certainty of persecution, the secrecy of providence, and then the only way you're going to survive. So start, start with me in verse 12, and let's read through it. Just make sure we grab what's going on. When it was day, just after Paul got delivered again by the, by the Roman tribune, the Jews... 
the tribune delivers him, keeps delivering him, won't let these Jews kill him, but so they go, okay, we gotta, we gotta step it up. They made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, we have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now therefore... You, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him to you, say you want to meet with him again, as though you were going to determine his case more exactly, and we are ready to kill him before he comes near. So not only are these 40 plus guys wanting to assassinate Paul, they even go to the religious leaders in Jerusalem, the high priest Caiaphas, and the other leaders of the council, these are supposed to be like the leaders of the leaders, godly guys who know their Bibles and love God, and they conspire with these assassins. They're like, oh, okay, sweet, we will do that. God, this is God's high priest, Caiaphas, who's wanting to get rid of Paul, and so he's breaking the law of God, lying, having this conspiracy in order to do something he thinks is serving God. Now the son of Paul's sister heard, their, heard of their ambush. So he went and entered the barracks and told Paul, Paul was a Roman citizen, so he obviously had some kind of rights. People could come in and visit him in jail. If you weren't Roman and you were in jail by Rome, nobody can visit you. But Paul has visitation rights, so his nephew comes in. So Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you, as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand and going, and going aside asked him privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than forty of their men are lying in ambush for him, who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready." waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you have informed me of these things. That's the word of the Lord. The, f the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the certainty of persecution. If you're a Christian, you will be persecuted. Not may, will. So what is persecution? Sometimes I think we blur the lines between suffering or persecution. Or someone says happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. You're like, I've just been so persecuted this Christmas season. It's like, no, that's not quite, that's not persecution. So the literal definition of it is that it's being mistreated on account of trusting and obeying Jesus. Someone, because of your faith in Jesus and obedience to Him, the way that you think, the way that you live, you are mistreated. It could be a small way, it could be a big way, but that's what persecution is. It's not just suffering, but being mistreated on account of trusting and obeying Jesus. It's exactly what Paul is experiencing here. They didn't just not like him. It's because he preached the gospel, the fulfillment of the law and the Old Testament in Christ and Jesus and what He's done for us. And these guys did not want that. They wanted to stay with the rules and try and justify themselves through their obedience and bolstering up their identity through their performance. And Paul comes and says, you could never do anything to make yourself acceptable to God. Jesus has done it all. Come to Him. They said, nah, we'll just kill you. So Paul's being persecuted, mistreated rather severely for Jesus' sake. In fact, Jesus, when we're thinking about persecution, Jesus mentions two different kinds of persecution. He mentions covert persecution and overt. I would call them that for simplistic terms. In Matthew 5, 11, this would be the covert, more like behind the scenes. It's not just outright, oh my gosh, they're being persecuted. But it's where you're shamed for Jesus' sake, or people lie about you. They don't just come and punch you in the face, but on account of you trusting and obeying Jesus, people twist the truth about you or try to paint you in a bad light. Or, as Jesus says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. 
that's the covert persecution. But then also, we have mentioned throughout the Gospels, and we see it in Paul especially, and all the rest of the apostles, what would be overt persecution. It's just out there. Covert is when you get shamed. Overt is when you get struck. You get beaten or even killed. Jesus straight up promised that the world would hate us. In John 15, he tells us, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, if you took on the world's ideals and the world's thoughts and lived according to what the world just says, this is right, this is good, this is where we're going. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Even to death. And Paul adds in 2 Timothy 3, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All will be. See those words that he says? He doesn't say possibly. If you desire to live a godly life, to follow Jesus, obey Jesus, cling to Jesus, tell people about Jesus for their good and their salvation, you will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, you have to think, Paul wrote Second Timothy after what's happening in Acts, you have to think this whole thing was in mind, probably even as he wrote that. It's like, why did he add that little thing at the end? Evil people and imposters. Imposters, they're pretending to be the people of God, but they're evil. They're conspiring to assassinate someone because they don't like what he says. Go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, lying to even be more evil. We will certainly experience persecution. We're starting to taste it a little bit in the Bible Belt, not as much here yet. But on the East Coast, on the West Coast, in America, Christians are experiencing it a lot more. It takes a while to get to the Bible Belt buckle here in Oklahoma, but hear this it's coming. It's coming. It's been throughout all church history that the church has been persecuted. We've just experienced a couple hundred years of something that the world has never seen. That a, a nation has predominantly accepted the morals and teachings, at least the foundational stuff, of a religion. It just so happens that Christianity was what most in our nation said, that's a pretty good guideline for how to live. It's not so anymore. Therefore, persecution will come. And... We may say, look at Paul, look at, look at me, look at other people. Why do bad things happen to good people? Jesus says, people are going to revile you on my account. Not because you you're dumb and people don't like you because you're dumb and mean. So you're going, to be, you're going to suffer and they're going to be mean to you. He says, you're going, to, you're going to be following me, you're going to be letting your light shine before others. And they're going to hate you for seeking the truth, for seeking to shine light for seeking to speak good news into people who are broken. It says they will hate you for it. But why do bad things happen to good people? You ever thought that? I think that's some. I think R.C. Sproul has the best response ever. Sproul says, why do bad things happen to good people? That only happened once. And he volunteered for the job. We have to remember that we're not the good guys. God has two categories, righteous and unrighteous. You, on your own, guess which one you fall into? This is which one I fall into. We are unrighteous because of our sin. We're not the good guys. Jesus is righteous. And through faith in Him, we're counted righteous. But we're not good. We're not the good guys. We're not the heroes. So, we have to get this thing out of our mind. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do you say that someone is good? Someone came up to Jesus and said, good teacher, and then started talking to him. Jesus just said, why do you call me good? Jesus wasn't denying that he is good, but he's like, you're just trying to flatter people. Oh, they're good. Based on what? On the world's standards. Come on. Be honest. Bad things don't happen. Well, it's, it, it only happened once. It happened to Jesus. So what did we learn from this? 
What do we need to take away from the certainty of persecution? I think if Jesus promised us trials and persecutions, you will be hated. Don't be shocked when it happens. You've got to prepare yourself and know. I think so many Christians are just shocked that people don't like them. For It's like, man, I'm, I'm trying to stand up for, for the truth and love this person and help. But people don't like you for it. Don't be shocked. Your Lord promised it. If they persecuted him, they'll persecute us as well. I think we also need to realize if if people are going to meet Jesus, if people are going to hear the gospel and respond to Jesus through faith, you are going to have to sacrifice your worldly reputation. You're going to have to lay down on the altar what the people in the world think about you. I think fear of man is the biggest reason we don't share the gospel with people. So we're scared they're not going to like it. Jesus said, they're not all going to like it. They're going to hate you. We just go, but I don't want them to. I'd rather people like me and not have this weird friction than share with them the only remedy for our deep problem. It's the gospel of Jesus. If people are going to meet Jesus, you will have to realize the world will not like me. And go. And it will be the most joyful thing you could ever do. You will be persecuted, but it's not without hope. Think through, who did that for you? Who loved you enough to sacrifice the possibility of you thinking they're dumb or preachy or whatever it may be, who did that for you? Loved you enough to say, hey man, here's, here's the gospel. Who loved you enough to invite you to church, even though some people are like, you think I need Jesus? Who loved you enough to do that? Who loved you enough to bring you? Who loved you enough to give you a Bible or books or meet with you and pray for you? Who sacrificed their worldly reputation so that you could meet Jesus? Someone did. Won't you do that for others? It's certain you'll be persecuted. Don't try to avoid it. Lean into it in obedience to Jesus and know it's coming. The second thing I want to draw your attention to is the secrecy of providence. You know, in Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, one of the really cool scenes is at the end of the Fellowship of the Ring, there's Gandalf, this wise wizard who is the leader of this big company, and they've set out to destroy evil, basically forever. That's the story. Gandalf's leading the way, and they come in under this mountain at one point, point. he comes up against a big enemy, and they're about to escape, and then Gandalf falls off into this huge pit and the leader, like the only hope, they, everyone else is like, I don't know what we're doing. The leader falls into this dark pit and just keeps falling. And that part of the story, it just ends. They just go on and everyone is just heartbroken, has no idea what's going on. Things are bad and get worse and get worse. And then he falls into a pit. The same type thing keeps happening to Paul. It's like, are you kidding me? These people will not eat. Unless they kill me? Like, that's some, that's some pretty big motivation. I don't know. I think they like to eat and drink as much as I do, but I'm going to want to get it done so that I could enjoy it again. The same thing honestly happened throughout the Scripture. We see it happening many a times. It happened to Joseph in the book of Genesis. His father loved him and gave him a coat of many colors, and his brothers hated him. He went out to Dothan to check on his brothers who were herding their flocks. They didn't receive him. They beat him up and they threw him in a pit, in a well. They stripped his cloak that his father had given him. He was stripped of the symbol of his father's love. They wanted to kill him, but his older brother saved him and said, let's just sell him into slavery. So they sold him for pieces of silver. Then he goes all the way to Egypt and ends up rising up a little bit at this guy named Potiphar's house. Things are going better. And then Potiphar's wife comes on to him. Joseph, like the only guy in the world, says, no. This lady is like, oh, come on, let's go to bed. And he's, he just keeps going, no, 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 no. And so she gets mad, lies about him, and has him thrown into prison. <laughs> Things just keep getting worse and worse and worse. We see that all throughout the Scripture. 
Here's the thing about Joseph's story, though. If every bit of that hadn't happened, Joseph's entire family and nation would have died. Because he ended up getting out of prison, and God raised him up to be the prime minister of Egypt. And a great famine came on the land where Joseph's family and nation lived, and they were all going to die. So they had to go to Egypt to try to get food from this Pharaoh. And it just so happened that Joseph... The brother they had sold into slavery, regarded as dead, threw, abandoned into a pit. He was the one that was able to give them food and even invite them to come to Egypt. And he saved the entire Jewish nation. Same thing happens to Paul here. We don't see it, but what we'll get into, what you'll see is Paul actually gets launched out of Jerusalem and goes towards Rome. Do you remember what Jesus promised them last week, the last verse? He said, take courage as you've testified to the facts about me here in Jerusalem. You're also going to do that in Rome. So Jesus says, you're going to go proclaim the gospel to the elites. You're going to go to Caesar, the most powerful man alive. You're going to go tell him the gospel and other kings and rulers the gospel on your way to Rome. That's what Jesus says to Paul. But at this part of the story, Paul's just in jail in Jerusalem. And he's not going anywhere. This plot that happened served, Jesus ruled over it sovereignly and used this plot, orchestrated it so that Paul, the tribune, would say, we've got to get Paul out of Jerusalem. So he sends him up north, and then he keeps going all the way to Rome. Here's the crazy thing. Without this plot of 40-plus men saying, we're not going to eat or drink until we kill Paul, without that, Paul would still be in Jerusalem and wouldn't go towards Rome to do what Jesus had set out for him to do, to preach the gospel to the elites. Do you see how crazy that is? Do you see God working over that? How, how did this stuff happen? How did Joseph just somehow rise up and save his family? How did Paul somehow, even though he was stuck there, terrible things happened to both of these guys, but it thrust them right where Jesus wanted them to be for their good and the good of others and His glory. Look through the pages of the Bible and you will find a God who is orchestrating every single thing for His glory and for your good. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what pit you may have fallen into. God has not abandoned you. He is sovereignly working in all things. As Genesis 50.20 says, Joseph, this is kind of one of the big themes of the Bible, honestly. We find it in, here at the end of Genesis where Joseph says to his brothers, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Would you memorize that verse? It doesn't say, you meant evil against me, but God ended up using it for good. No. It says God meant for that to happen for good. So that people would be saved. So that He would be glorified. You, we see this. God is providentially working in every way for our good and His glory. But do you see how secret it is? Imagine what Paul's thinking at this point when he's in jail. Oh great, I'm in jail still, and all these guys want to kill me, and they're not eating or drinking until they do. Wonderful. Jesus said I'm going to Rome, but I don't think I'm going to make it out of Jerusalem. He doesn't know what's happening. Probably until years later, he looks back and goes, I would have never left Jerusalem unless those guys tried to kill me. And the tribune was forced to send me up. Imagine what Joseph was thinking when his brothers threw him into that pit, stripped of his clothes. Uh, I'm done. <laughs> he hears him talking outside of the pit, and they're saying, hey, let's kill, you know, let's just kill him. We'll tell him, we'll tell dad that some wild animal killed him. He's just like, oh, great. And then his older brother's like, no, 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 we'll just sell him into save slavery. He's like, well, that's a little better than death, I guess, but still pretty bad. He had no idea where God was orchestrating all this, providentially working to take Him. We have no idea. And that's the, that's the truth for you and I too, friends. God is providentially working for your good in every millisecond of your life. Every square inch of your life in Christ has been claimed. It says, I will work all things for your good, for my glory. 
but you will hardly ever know what's going on. We typically, if we see it in this life, we may not even see it until we see Jesus face to face, and then, oh my gosh, this is why those things happen. Even terrible things, this is why they happen. And we will fall at His feet and worship Him all the more for His providence in it all. But in this life, sometimes we see, oh my gosh, that happened. But you don't see it until it's in the rearview mirror. We're never driving through a storm and just go, I know exactly why this happened. I never see that at all. But many times, you'll look in the rearview mirror and go, Jesus, you were working in some way. You were changing me. You were pushing me to a situation that you wanted me in. You were doing whatever you were doing. Oh my gosh. But realize it's very secret. We don't know. So we have to, we have to trust. We have to know. We have to look to the promises of the Scripture. And what do we learn? Well, a couple, three things. Realize that sin can't stop God's plan. That's here. These guys want to kill him. The high priests are in it as well. It's just wicked. That in no way stopped God's plan. Joseph's brothers and their sin against him, that in no way stopped God's plan. Joseph has sin as well. He was prideful. He was arrogant to his brothers. It's like, I had these dreams that you're all going to bow down to me one day. You're like, dude, we're all older than you. We're going to beat you up. If you have dreams that everyone's going to bow down to, you don't just go to them and like, hey, I had a dream, you're all going to bow down to me. Check it out. And then they get mad at you, and then you have another dream about it, and then you come back and say, I had another dream, you're going to bow down to me. Even you, Dad. It's like, yeah, he was a little prideful. He had it coming a little bit, but not like he had. But through it all, he uses the worst evils in you and in me and in others to work out for good. Sin cannot thwart the plan of God. One of the second things I think, second thing I think you need to take away, and I do, is that when it seems like God is killing you, it may be that He's saving you. It may seem like He is ripping you apart. And you have no idea why it's happening, but it just may be that He's saving your life. He's saving your mission. He's saving what He wants you to do. And though God may be silent in a situation, we may not know. I don't know what's going on. I don't have an answer to this. He may be silent, but He's never absent. Never is He absent for a second in your life. We have to know that His providence is very secret. And the last thing I want to point you to is really the only way you're going to survive. That secrecy of providence, that is stinking difficult. We can theoretically understand that and see these crazy examples in Scripture, right? You look at Paul, you look at Joseph, it's like, man, that's awesome. But when you're going through the storm, it's not that easy. You don't just go, yeah, I've got cancer, but, you know, it's going to happen. That, that's not, it's not easy to do that, right? So how are we going to survive Imagine it was, it's pretty, one of the worst things that can happen to have 40 plus guys say, hey, we're not going to eat or drink till we kill you, right? An oath. Did you know Jesus made a similar oath like that the night before he was crucified? Jesus in the Lord's Supper actually made that same oath. However, not to kill anyone, Jesus made an oath to be killed for you and for me. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus, with His disciples, gives Him the cup and gives, gives them the bread and says, This cup is in remembrance of My blood. It's poured out for you. My blood will be spilt to make a covenant, an agreement between you and God where you will be adopted into His family, forgiven of your sins. Your identity will be based on what I have done through my death for you. It says this bread is representing my body is broken for you. And he tells them to do this, to keep doing it in remembrance of what he's done on the cross to pay for our sin, to pay our debt to God. He says, keep doing it. Paul in 1 Corinthians says, Jesus said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So we do it every week. But within him giving us the Lord's Supper, do you remember that he says, I will not drink of this again until I drink it new with you in the kingdom of heaven. 
What's he saying? He's making the same exact oath these guys made, but Jesus, and you see the context back here in the first century, the disciples knew exactly what he's saying. That's an oath. I will not eat or drink until I can make this happen. But notice that Jesus, in his love and grace for you, says, I will not eat and drink of this celebratory meal again until I've made you perfect. Oh my gosh. And that's the gospel, friends. The only way you're going to be able to go through the storm knowing he's, he's providential. I know He's working all things together for good. Even though people mean it for evil, He means it for good. You can go through the storm knowing that, keeping your eyes on Jesus, not by knowing, you know, I'm going to stay dedicated to Jesus. I know He's good. I know He's going to get me through this. I know it's for His glory and my joy. The more you do that, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, you will fail. But if you look to Jesus making an oath, saying, I'm going to be destroyed unless I can make you perfect. I will even be destroyed so that I can make you perfect. The more you see that it's all about His commitment to you, not yours to Him. You see that He's so committed to you, He went to the cross and is not going to party until He parties with you. The more even in the storm you'll say, I know the one who controls the storms. I know the one who went to a cross. Friends, I think so many times we understand the gospel's good news, and this is all riding on Jesus, but we live day to day. We think, we operate under this false notion that our eternal joy, our ultimate satisfaction, our comfort and safety is somehow riding on us. I think you do that. I think I do that frequently. Friends, you've got to remember, this whole thing is riding on Jesus. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus doesn't say, never leave me nor forsake me. No, he, Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'm not going anywhere. You try to run, I'm going to catch you. That's why you've had times in your life that you've strayed or you've done stupid things. And Jesus is always there through His church, through His word, through His spirit, saying, I still love you. Come back. Come back. We know that's true. We know it's true in the Bible. That's true. That's the gospel, friends. No sin is a match for His grace. That's why Martin Luther called Jesus the hound of heaven. He said, He will sniff you out. He's not letting you go. The hound of heaven is committed to you. So bank on His commitment to you, not your commitment to Him. That's how you'll survive. Lastly, I really just feel like some of you are, have fallen into a pit. Maybe some kind of, some sin that you're trapped in, some suffering, sickness, betrayal. Hear me. If it's not you, it's someone you know. If it's not now, it will be. Jesus has not forgotten you. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come and bank your confidence on my commitment to you, not yours to me. Whatever pit you're in or may fall into, remember that Jesus was once in a grave. If your faith is in him, he will bring you out of it in this life or the next. Let that strengthen you to trust His providence, to embrace persecution for His sake, and to tell others the good news of the gospel for their good and for God's glory. At the end of all of the Lord of the Rings, Samwise Gamgee, I think this is the gospel according to Sam, he sees Gandalf again, because if you know the story, Gandalf comes back. It's like kind of a resurrection and a sense. Tolkien was a Christian, so we see why he used this stuff. But he comes back, and Sam hadn't seen him. It's, it's like a year's gone by. The ring is destroyed, evil's defeated, and Sam wakes up, and Gandalf's there. It's like, last time I saw him, he fell into a pit. thought all hope was lost. And Sam says, Gandalf, you're back. I thought you were dead. Then again, I thought I was dead too says, is everything sad going to come untrue? 
what's happened to the world? Now you may see what's happened in Middle Earth, but I know what's happened in this world. Jesus has come and lived and died for you. He's committed to you. Put your confidence in Him. Pray with me. Oh, Father, we need grace to not just hear these things, but to put our confidence in Jesus. Help us to see the oath that He's taken in the Lord's Supper and to be changed by it. Help us to not pass up taking of the Lord's Supper as we gather to worship. Help us to take of it. And remember that we're declaring Jesus' death and His promise to make us perfect one day in His kingdom. Help us to embrace persecution, to embrace the fact that the world will hate us, but persevere in sharing the gospel and obeying you so you may be glorified and other people may be saved. Help us to trust in your providence and know that it's secret. Help us to look to the cross and be assured that you're in it for our good. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen.